Well, hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining our webinar today at the beginning of uh, your fall semester if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, today, we're going to talk about transforming reading engagement with social annotation. And um, my name is Joe Ferraro. I'm part of the Hypothesis team, but I'm super excited to have uh, Nick Brown. He's the VP of Product at Vital Source, and Diana Ford, I'm an instructional designer and adjunct instructor at Missouri Southern State University. We're going to talk a lot about um, how they are using social annotation to drive learning engagement and improve student outcomes. So we're gonna cover a few things today. Uh, first, we're gonna discuss the benefits of hypothesis with course reading, talk a bit about the impact of social annotation on e-text. Uh, then we're gonna to get to the meat of it and have a great conversation with Diana and open it up for Q&A uh, for you all toward the end. Because we do have a large number of folks here, we are doing the Q&A uh, with the Q&A function. You should see it right along the bottom. And so we will answer questions if they make sense in real time. Otherwise, we'll get to them at the end, but we don't want to forget anyone. Um, so again, thanks so much for joining. I'm Joe from the Hypothesis team. Uh, if you're not familiar with Hypothesis, we are the uh, leader in social learning in the higher education space here in North America. Uh, we offer a social annotation tool that lives directly in your learning management system that allows students to have conversations in real time over the course content and reading that's in front of them. Social annotation gives students an opportunity to build community within the course, but it can also really drive powerful learning outcomes. Uh, first, it promotes reading completion. So students have to actually read the content to complete their assignment and complete their annotations. But it also really increases critical reading and thinking, allowing students to have conversations directly on the content, as opposed to maybe jumping over to a discussion board. It helps students really reduce that metacognitive load so they can focus on what's in front of them. This does live directly in your learning management system. So if you're using an LMS today, like Canvas, Blackboard, D2L, Brightspace, or Moodle, this is really simple to set up on top of your existing assignments. And it constantly brings students back to the text, which is one of the most critical pieces of course material that a student has that sometimes can be overlooked. And so we're really excited to talk about how Vital Source and Hypothesis have been working together to transform student engagement and reading. And with that, I'll hand it over to Nick so he can talk about how we did that. Yeah, sure. So um, what we're looking at here is a couple of examples where we've had uh, instructors at um, multiple different schools and multiple different disciplines using our integrated solution with Hy Hypothesis assigned as part of the um, as part of their gradebook wrapped around the e-text that was assigned in that course. Um, you know, as Joe mentioned on the the prior slide, um, you know, one of the behaviors that um, this solution is really meant to do is encourage students to actually complete their course reading by having some of that gradebook accountability wrapped around the e-text. Um, you know, one one number to to have in your mind as we look at the the data here and as we look at the examples um, is that you know we've seen um, both in in papers published in the research literature as well as in some papers that our team has put out there to to reproduce those examples. Um, if all that you do is put your textbook on your syllabus and hope that students read that material, on average, you're going to see that about 10 to 15 percent of the pages that you assign actually get read by students. You need some some hook. You need some motivator. You need some tool to try and drive that engagement that you want to see. Um, and we're seeing that Hypothesis is a really great example of that kind of tool that adds that social layer, adds that critical thinking dynamic, and then really drives the behavior that I think we want to see. Um, and so in these two cases that we're looking at here, um, we saw really, really improved student engagement with the text. And if you flip to the next slide, I'll, I'll show you a, a good visual example here. Um, what we're looking at here is um, you know, kind of a, a histogram style view of a really simple question. How many days in the semester did the student crack open their digital textbook and read? It's one of the nice advantages of having a digital textbook over a print book is that we have this data. We can go look. We can see what are students doing inside of those materials. And in this case, we're looking at a, a really crisp before and after comparison. So we're looking at um, the same book, the same professor, the same course before and after they implemented Hypothesis on top of the textbook as a way to motivate student engagement. 
Um, and in the red, what you can see is, um, you know, 50% of the students were engaging with that textbook, engaging with that digital book on seven days or fewer in that in that term. Um, the most common outcome, right, 15% of the students opened their book on two unique days in the term. Really not a meaningful part of their course experience. And I'm sure if we went and tabulated which of the assigned pages they were reading, we'd be close to that 10 to 15% number. Um, on the other hand, in our pilot course where we had hypothesis wrapping that gradebook accountability around the book, adding that social discussion layer, adding that critical thinking um, aspect of it, you see students much, much more engaged in their course material with the median being 36 days of student engagement in the textbook. Um, now, what's really fun about this example course is, you know, I remember talking to this, this professor um, a, a while back, um, they had been reaching for this solution for multiple semesters in a row. Um, they tried other integrated products with social learning. They tried using Bookshelf, our e-textbook reader, and a separate discussion board with discrete assignments that said, go to your ebook, take a screenshot of a page, bring it over to the discussion board, and we'll do discussion over there. And none of the things that they tried drove the usage engagement that, that they wanted to see with the level of ease of use and convenience that students and the faculty needed to have to, to really embrace the solution. Um, the discussion board example was interesting because the data actually said it worked pretty well on the data side, but the students and the, the TAs hated it. It was just too much work. There was too much friction. There was too much cognitive overhead to try and use those two solutions side by side. Um, so this chart chart is really great. We're, you know, More movement to the right is what we want to see here. And if you go to the next slide, we've got a couple more data points on this. Um, in the physics course at UT Austin, I mentioned that the median number of days in that semester um, went up to, to 36. You can see where those comparison courses were in two different examples, um, much, much, much lower. Uh, and then we saw the same thing in the communication studies course at, at Minnesota as well, um, kind of almost 3xing on the, the median number of days of studying inside of their textbook. Um, next slide. Uh, we've also, you know, of course, talked to our, our instructors about, you know, so we see this in the data. Do you see it on your side of the fence in terms of your interaction with the students and what you see them taking away from the course? Joe, you want to talk about this a little bit? Absolutely. And what we hear time and time again as we speak to the thousands of instructors who are running their courses using Hypothesis is that just simply putting some stakes in the ground and saying you need to do your reading and have these conversations allows students to understand the course material more deeply. I will admit I'm one of those students that was guilty that probably cracked my book less than 10 or 15% of the time on a paper book, but there was always a different way to get caught up. In today's hybrid and high flex environments, sometimes if you're simply just looking at these discussion boards to Nick's example and students are agreeing all the time, you haven't learned anything and it sort of says, well, I guess I didn't need to read in the first place. So as students can start to really peel back those layers and see how other students have different perspectives on that same material, they understand why they're reading that in the first place but it can also drive really market improvement in writing and critical thinking skills. This is something we've seen time and time again. Uh, we work with an R1 institution who uses Hypothesis for um, some of their pharmacy courses. So pretty in-depth scientific readings for first year students. And what they found was using Hypothesis to allow students to work in what they called reading groups and read these dense materials together didn't just improve the students overall grade in the classroom, but they were finding that these undergraduate students were reading at a graduate level because they had to actually dissect the text and the material in a way that they typically weren't doing with online reading. On top of that, it all really just ties into the fact that if you're reading the book, you're participating in the class and you're doing the outputs that are required, is there a meaning to that learning? And Hypothesis does a really great job at sort of threading that needle and tying it all together. So students understand why they're doing it and that's gonna drive more persistence on the reading. And that's why you see these students are reading anywhere from three to five times more because they're getting some value out of it. It's just like anything else. And especially with today's student when they can get a whole lot more out of something that's in their hand, you need to give them something that's in it for them. And having those valuable interactions and building community among your peers is a great way to do that. And so it's great to hear from Nick and I about this, but we thought it would be amazing to have someone that's using this in her classroom day to day talk about how she's incorporating 
social annotation across her course material. So really thrilled to welcome Diana Fordham. As I mentioned, she's an instructional designer and adjunct instructor at Missouri Southern State University. And uh, she's been a great champion of hypothesis and vital source from the get-go. I'll go ahead and turn off our presentation so we can have more of a conversation. But Diana, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, you know what you're currently working on and where you focus. Okay, awesome. It's great to be here. Um, I am an advocate of hypothesis and vital source. I um, have found uh, many years that I've been teaching that this has been a great way to engage students in the material. Now, note that I teach um, survey courses. I also teach honors courses and upper division courses. So I use hypothesis the same across the board in many cases, but on my higher level courses, I use it a little bit differently. So I want to talk first just about um, why we do what we do at Missouri Southern and how I even stumbled on hypothesis and vital source. And the first thing that um, came to my attention, I'm the chair of the OER department, the Open Educational Resources Department, and we actually defined in our OER um, policy um, vital source as a second tier. Um, of course, totally free is you know the uh, ground level of OER, but realizing that it's really hard to find materials. And so when we adopted um, Vital Source as our second tier of OER, we were able to convert a lot of our courses into using Vital Source because it's an e-text that goes right seamlessly into our LMS. And then when we use Hypothesis to make students accountable for what they're reading and for the material in the textbook, it has really taken off. And in my own courses, I can tell you, it's an amazing tool. And so you say hold students accountable. What were the problems that you were encountering before you came across this solution? So at the very beginning, it was a student cost-saving initiative. And so in my own classes and in the classes that we were developing for online, um, you could see that students weren't buying the textbook. <laughs> mm -hmm. And until we got instant access or same-day access, you know, now when they sign up, they pay for their textbook. And so then it became, we need to give the best, give them the best value for their dollar. But it's just that nobody was buying the textbook. And, you know, I would give assignments and you could tell they were ill-prepared. And so how do we engage students in reading um, was probably one of the first questions. And how do we use open educational resources if, if we're going to truly be a cost-saving initiative for the students, which is one of the impetuses behind why we chose what we chose. Um, where I find now that I can hold them accountable is that their hypothesis assignments for every chapter is 10% of their grade. So I'm telling you right up front, guys, when I tell my students, you don't read your textbook, you're not getting an A in this course. Mm -hmm. And so I do interact with the um, chapters um, and it, it, hopefully in a, not just reading and answering questions, you know, I'll ask a question and then I have them go through the chapter. You have to highlight four um, paragraphs that answer the question in your own words using the text. That's 10% of your grade. Now I can tell you, I have 28 students in my Western Civ this semester. Of the 28, we're only in week three, 26 have been in first three weeks. The 27th just came in today to do week three because she knows she's not getting a good grade and I can't tell you where the 28th student is yet. So it does work and it does get them engaged. Now, are they equally engaged? No, I mean, some of them are kind of, come on, you can do better than this, but this is changing behavior on our campus. So, you know, by the hopefully by the end of my 15th week, I'm gonna be able to see improvement in um, how students are interacting with the text, how students are interacting with the rest of the content in um, my chapter. And so it, it's been, and this is probably, what is this, the fifth semester that I've used both of those together, fifth or sixth. And of course I keep my own stats and I keep you know what my students grade um, distribution and I can make a direct correlation um, with in getting them involved in the text and using the text as part of the content of my online class. And I do this for my face-to-face -face and also for my hybrid classes, high flex classes. Um, they still have the same assignment, getting them engaged. And so how do you introduce that? We're going to have a reading and it's actually going to be part of your grade. That might be a pretty novel thing for a lot of these students. How do they react? 
Um, well, I don't get a whole lot of reaction because I people tell me I'm intimidating. My students do. So at the very first, it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, what is she talking about? But I do step them through that. I mean, I have a synchronous in my online. I have a synchronous uh, incident every week where I can go over this. But in my face to face classes, I show them the value of it. And I can tell you it's working when we do go into the class discussions and people will say, well, in the textbook, it says, when have you ever had that happen? <laughs> Up until, you know, the last five or six semesters, I never heard that, right? And now they use what they've read in the text as arguments for maybe an on online discussion or an in-class discussion. So it has been very, very successful um, by making it, them responsible for it, 10% of your grade. And I'm sure at the beginning of the semester, they're afraid of you and then they get to know you and they like you as much as we do. But how do they feel about this at by week 15? How do students feel about it? Well, I can tell you the feedback I get because I do um, give a survey at the end. Tell me about this, you know, what you feel. And they feel that it, it's um, it engages them with other students as well. So now I have it set up to where I they could see each other's right. Um, I do in one of my other classes and, and note with AI, and I know we talked about this earlier, but hypothesis can be an AI resistant assessment as well. Um, especially there's ways you can set it up and I have two instructors and in my higher division uh, honors course, I do this, I set them up as a individual group and then I give them assignments for assessment that they can't go to AI for that. They probably could access AI while they're in hypothesis, but you wouldn't be able to answer the question without using the text to be able to answer the question because it's that specific. And so um, as I lecture and um, teach faculty and the community how to use artificial intelligence in education, that's the big thing. How do you use it and make sure it's AI resistant, your assessment is AI resistant and hypothesis has really helped us in that um, in several classes. I, I really love that term AI resistant assessment. I, I haven't heard that one before. I, I have to imagine that that resonates with your peers. Are, are you are you sharing this around? Do you have other folks at your university who are interested in it? it that, oh. that seems like the critical problem to solve right now today as an instructor. That's the buzzword. Yeah. And actually, it was our department that came up with AI resistant assessment um, for this campus that, um, yeah, because that's their biggest fear, right, is that they're, everyone's going to cheat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not going to be able to detect. Um, I propose as well, no AI yourself as well as you should. So you can detect AI because I can detect when a student uses AI most of the time. It's not foolproof, but with hypothesis and with vital source, both of those working together with the text, that's been a phenomenal advancement in making that argument. So yeah, when I'm talking to my faculty, I'm going, hey, let me set you up with hypothesis. And most of them are already on vital source. So that's not a far um, leap, but how to connect those together mm -hmm. has been um, not a challenge, but has been a goal to show them how they can use that. And I mean, AI resistance, it's, it's something we hear about every day as folks are looking for ways to sort of combat the the same response essentially getting submitted by so many different students. What does that look like in a hypothesis assignment? Like talk about how you structure it and why AI just doesn't work there. So in one of my upper divisions, I just, um, I mean, there, we're going over a text and it's a, a book that we got from Vital Source, but it's an, a reader type thing. And so their first question was, how does James Lowen, James Lowen decide, um, decipher in his um prelude to the book on why he's writing the book and how does that filter into the discussion of questioning everything that we do, you know, question everything that we read. And so the students had to go in, answer that question by reading that preface of the book and pulling out quotes from James Lowen, highlighting and pulling out and seeing how that particular quote is how they thought or what they got from the lesson we just had. And it was truly amazing, and they were all different. You know, and so, and so you, you're you're requiring them down to that level of detail of highlight the passage and then talk about it. So yes. that, that's how you're enforcing it. You can't even just go copy paste it into AI. No. I want to see your highlight right there in the book. And why you pick that highlight, and how I does that. that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, it's been amazing. 
they're not all on the same level, you know, I, you know, the high, the honors kids are more on a level that I can do that. But even in my um, survey courses, it's the same thing, although I let them see each other's posts. And I don't necessarily see that they're repeating each other, you know, that they truly are. And I, uh, they're not history majors. So I tell them from the beginning, I'm not expecting you to read from page one to page 50. I'm expecting you to view the book, pick out four paragraphs that you feel were important and why do you feel that this was something that was your aha moment or whatever and that's what they have to um to, uh, annotate so it's it's been fun and the students responses are they like it i mean it is it's a requirement do they love history no but i do get to meet with them in my online class once a week and i just had one at 10 o'clock and most of them will say they're prepared because they've already done the hypothesis. So they know we're going to be talking about King Uns, uh, the Pharaoh answer. You know, we're, we know we're going to be talking about the afterlife because they've done the reading. And so now I can take it to the next level. And that's how I do in a flipped environment is that that's required before you even come to the discussion, whether so, online or face to face. And so what this is doing is making sure that these students are coming a bit more prepared how does that impact your lectures or your async sessions? Like, what does that allow you to do more of? Let the, so let me just tell you, I, you know, I go over all the housekeeping and let's say my in-sync, my in-space sessions, and then I give them, I, they, I send them off into separate rooms and they discuss a topic. Feral Unser is, was a primary source of my textbook. So they'd already read it. They'd already gone through that. They would already answered one question then they have 20 minutes that they have to discuss that with each other. And then when they come back with me, I'm not in that room when they do it, they come back with me, I can take them to the next level, but they're prepared for their class discussion because they've all done the assignment. And this may be sort of leading the witness, but what was this like a few years ago when you had to have students commit to separate reading groups before you were using these different tools? I don't know that I did it because it was unsuccessful. No, the flipped was okay. Mm -hmm. If I gave them a quiz or said, watch this video, you know, that type of thing, you know, they would come in partially prepared, but this really has them go into primary documents. And it's just a way I can tell what their grade is and I can tell what they're highlighting. So I grade that on Monday morning. My first in space is Tuesday evening. So I already know what they picked out of the Mm -hmm. And I've already gone in and said, what questions did they have on the reading? This is maybe a discussion that I'm going to have them discuss in their separate groups. You know, what did they highlight? If, if there's a consistent highlight or annotation a part of the text, you bet I'm bringing it up in the discussion. You know, so that's how I do that. So it's really been helpful to me because I get to see it all. So and, I, I love how earlier you, you kind of connected um, the dots from providing access and, and making material affordable through to driving student engagement. That's a, you know, we're, we're talking to faculty and schools and, and students and publishers about that connection all the time these days, right? You, you have to get them access to the materials. You have to make it affordable for them. That's job one. And then job two is get them to use the darn stuff, right? Um, and I think we've got a lot of people who have kind of checked those first couple of boxes, right? They're participating in a program like, like you've set up at, at MSSU, um, but they're not yet where you are in terms of driving student engagement. Um, so you know, maybe what advice would you have for someone who's who's at that point? They know that the materials are there, they're affordable for their students, but they haven't yet layered on hypothesis or something like it to drive the kind of student engagement that you're talking about. Um, how hard was it for you to get started? You know, help help someone get on that same bandwagon because these student outcomes sound really great. Well, I I've been looking. It's like where have you guys been my whole life, right? When I finally found the tools, that's where I was. It was like this is what I need. So I had always been looking to make that connection. So it wasn't a far leap for me to say how do I make them accountable? Because right now at that point. There was nothing I could do, even pop quizzes. That's not a fair assessment because that's not what students necessarily take out of a reading. And that's not even considering their background, um, you know, how much of history they knew. I mean, when I had a student today tell me, 
I didn't know the pyramids were tombs of the pharaohs. Do you see the different levels that we're at? So for me to assume that they knew, knew what I expected them to know was where I was lacking. And so it wasn't a far leap for me, but if you're considering doing that, it's such an easy thing to integrate. It, if, if you're using vital source, you know, and have um, hypothesis. And then I have, you know, I do websites as well. I'll have a hypothesis over a website. So a history website, so they can see, you know, how do you access this? You know, what is it that I'm trying to get? So there's so many other things you can use hypothesis with. It's just not vital source, but it happens to be a huge tool um, in a way that I gauge student engagement and help hold them accountable for the reading. I don't know how else to do that. And we had a question from the audience that really ties to this, especially because students are in different places and may not have the same frame of reference. How do you grade annotations? Is it just based on participation? Is it based on their level of effort? I'm sure it, there's taken a few tries to get there. Okay, so on my lower level, um, on my survey classes. So you have to select four different paragraphs and I need four sentences or more on why you selected that. So that's what I'm grading on. Do you have the four sentences? Does it make sense? And are you tying it back to that? Now, as I get to upper level courses where they do have more of a solid foundation, um, a mutual foundation on the topic, I can get more detailed, like here's the question and now you use James Lowen or whatever text I'm using to um, support your answer to this. It's got to come from the text and it might not even be something you even thought about or something you even agree with. But if this is your answer, then you've got to support it with text. Um, so that's how I do it for my survey classes. Yeah, it's really participation and that they've met all my requirements and it makes sense right it's not that it can be just gibberish and trust me i look for that because i know probably three semesters ago somebody wrote a paragraph that had nothing to do with anything and what he told me because i didn't think you were reading him so yeah so yeah you, you, you'll i'll say minus three points don't do this again you know that type of thing so yeah and it's, it's interesting, we don't think the students are reading and they don't think we're reading their responses. So it, it sort of perpetuates this cycle of who's gonna do less and still get the credit. Um, one thing that you've talked a lot about in other conversations that we've had is about your digital backpacks at MSSU. And I think this is a really innovative concept and I think it's one that ties really nicely with vital source and hypothesis. But why don't you tell the audience about that? Because it seems like something that many schools should be looking into. When um, during COVID, um, the federal government gave CARES money um, to universities that were looking for different ways to engage students in online learning environments because all of us went to online. And so we took that money and our department went out and started searching. That's how we found Hypothesis. Um, we had already been using Vital Source to a point on um, at that point, but we did other external integrations that nicely fit into our LMS. We do Yellow Dig. Um, I use PlayPosit, I use Hypothesis, I use Padlet. And um, that money after the CARES went away, um, we sustain by fees, um, hybrid fees that actually pay for those um, external integrations into Blackboard. And it has been probably the best thing that our department has ever done because I don't know that several of our instructors, whether it be online, face-to-face -face, or hybrid, could do without some of these tools. Um, we also have uh, InSpace, and if anyone was using InSpace, it's a virtual um, meeting place. It's amazing, but they're folding their doors at the end of this month, and we're devastated. I mean, I'm in tears. I, I just can't believe that they're not no longer to be here. So we're looking at things to replace it because we've become so used to having these synchronous weekly meetings, several of us, you know, with our online classes which I highly incentivize by, incentivize, by the way, I say, if you attend all of mine, you're our final exam exempt, and that will get people to your <laughs> weekly synchronous in an online learning class. Um, but if that's going away, we've got to find something that's comparable that will engage students again. And so we're in the process of looking again, um, but it, we've bec they've become so valuable, those tools to our presence at Missouri Southern that if any of you want to know, contact me and I'll sh tell, share with you um, how we do it and how we promote that 
on our campus. And especially as you're adding new tools, one thing that we hear from folks all the time is, I just don't have the bandwidth to add something new. This is going to, how do you, how did you find ways to integrate this into your existing materials and workflows without having to reinvent the wheel? I think one of the advantages of this office is, is that all of us are instructors and I teach quite a bit. And so I used it in my own class. And so I can go out and um, promote hypothesis because I use it and because I can show how I and I use my class statistics on grade distribution, on feedback that I get from my students. So that's really, really helpful. Um, what we did before we had that type of data was go out to find other people who had that type of data. I presented at Blackboard in July, and of course, I had spent a year getting student feedback, and that was probably the big thing that people said in reaction to my presentation was what students were saying about it, how it changed their engagement, how it changed their understanding, you know, of the topic. And, and that's what I get. I get the feedback, you know, and my feedback even today, I didn't even know that tombs were Pharaoh's, or pyramids were Pharaoh's tombs. You know, it's like, sets me back a minute because I'm assuming that they come with that. And so it's things like that constantly that I'm constantly getting feedback. And so again, I'm willing to share that with anyone that wants it. I mean, the, the data on, on the impact on students is, is really compelling. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what order of magnitude of impact are you talking about? Are you, are you seeing it in particular students? You know, one thing I, I've seen with other tools is, well, maybe it's not going to completely change the paradigm for a go-getter who's already doing everything, but you see that impact more around those students who are maybe more on the boundaries or that, that movable student who you might be able to to take from a D to a C. What, what does the impact look like for you in your courses? I think the huge impact is the exposure. And what I mean by that, you know, we all can get textbooks. We've always required textbooks, but if I have a reader, if I'm teaching on um, World War II and I teach, um, take in Her John Hersey's um, uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, uh, I forgot what the title is, but it, I expose them to other things through hypothesis that's the feedback I get. The textbook is so much, they know they have to read it, but when they have to use our other sources that they had no clue and wouldn't even know how to look for it. So that's some of the impact that I'm getting. You know, the story of Hiroshima that Tom Hersey wrote about, you know, the six people that witnessed it and wrote about it. Um, that is life-changing for students because we can talk about World War II, we can talk about the atomic bombs and everything, but when you talk about firsthand experiences, no one knows that book was written. None of my students know that book was written until I expose them to that. So it's exposure, um, and, and I love doing that um, with hypothesis because it's a way to break it down chapter by chapter, assigning it week by week, and then having them engaged in that material. And that's where I get the feedback. So the exposure. Does that answer your question? Or yeah, I, mean, I love that. That's you know, I have to think instilling that curiosity is something that you're reaching for, and it's so hard to trigger that in a student who might be a little bit unplugged, right, in a, a hybrid environment like that. And that's what I, I'll get feedback too: is that you engaged us. You know, I've never been in an online class where we're this engaged. I know people because we're and discussion questions don't do it. You mm -hmm. know, that is not a student to student community anymore. I use another uh, external integration, but if you can get them involved in the reading, see what other people are doing. And then of course the synchronous um, on weekly meeting that we have, that's what they say, because they can talk about the text. They can talk about what they learned. And I don't even know what they're talking about in their rooms, right? Because I'm out of there. 20 minutes, guys. And then when you meet back with me, I want to report. And um, then they have to give takeaways, but yeah. And I can't tell you how much it involves what they've read because I'm holding them accountable to that. Love that. And so we've talked a lot about, you know, the text content and even some websites that you refer to. Are there specific types of content you find are most effective for social annotation versus others? Or do you find it's really applicable for all types of readings? I haven't found anyone that it's not applicable. 
I mean, every, I mean, textbooks, um, PDFs, I can go and pull a PDF from our library um, databases, all the databases, our library, I can download that PDF and I can use that in hypothesis. So if it's a current article, you know, I know that one of our health sciences is using the nursing journal and she pulls an article and they have to annotate it. And it's something that they would get if they went to the library, but they can download it as a PDF. And by the way, and you know, with Vital Source, there's so many titles, but sometimes I can go in and get an outdated book and download that from our library and upload that and have Hypothesis be, you know, use that same OER is the same way, download it as a PDF, upload it into Blackboard, and then I can assign Hypothesis. So I haven't found anything that it doesn't work with. Yeah, we have a couple questions from the audience. Um, first one is, I guess, for me, uh, how does Hypothesis handle accessibility and privacy concerns? And uh, this is something that we really take seriously. So we've got our, we have a SOC 2 for your security concerns. We also do have our VPAT and our HECFAT. And um, I'm sure that our folks that are manning the chat can share links to our privacy and accessibility concerns. Um, have you specifically worked with students that needed things like screen readers, et cetera, to complete their assignments that you've heard positive feedback from? I haven't. Um, I know that our annotate our, our closed captioning on videos is more where I hear back from that, but not on hypothesis. So I haven't had any screen readers like uh, any students that have requested that. I'm not sure how we would handle it because we are not proactive in that. We're reactive because we don't have the finances to have a whole department. So if it were to come back to me um, that we have a student, I would reach out to you and I'd figure out how we do that, but I have not had one. And I don't think anyone else is on this campus yet either. Okay. Um, we also have a question from Karen in the audience. Um, do you have any issues with fair use downloading the PDFs of articles from the library websites? I do not because we use the TEACH Act of 2002, 110A and 110B. And that is our defense because copyright is a defense. And um, so we have gone the process of doing that um, and using that as what we use to be able to do that. I have no issues with that because we are a closed environment and I can do that under the TEACH Act 2002. Okay. Uh, we also had a question, just what types of eBooks are compatible with Hypothesis? And so that's one I will take as well. Um, and so currently we do support any type of EPUB file, but our partnership with uh, Vital Source covers any textbooks that come through the Verba platform and Verba Collect. So if your school is inclusive access or first day access, as Diana mentioned, if you have a Hypothesis subscription, this is available for you today. You just need to talk to your account manager. We can make sure that's set up. Uh, we also have another question from Ivana that is, this all sounds great, but what is the actual process of getting this integrated with my course on Blackboard? Uh, and that's a great question. So first, it depends on uh, which what school you're at. So Ivana will reach out to you separately. Uh, this is an external tool that is pretty simple to use. Um, Diana, you, you use this every day. So I guess if someone's looking to get started with this quickly, how do you advise them to do it? Okay. Note that we use it as an LTI 1.3, and that is something our administration has to set up. Um, funny story, up until last week, apparently this was a building block until I ran into an issue with another class with hypothesis. And of course, it works in the new Ultra Blackboard and Canvas, I believe, is an LTI 1.3. And so I involved um, our technology department to begin with to be able to set that up correctly. And then it will it became an available tool within our LMS, and it is just a matter of a push of a button, setting the parameters, and it embeds beautifully into the content or wherever you have it embedded. Yep. Great. And so we do support 1.3 and 1.1 for Canvas, D2L, Brightspace, Blackboard, and Blackboard Ultra, as well as Moodle. Uh, if a school doesn't have a subscription, you can definitely speak to someone on our team, so we'll follow up with you. But we also do have this great partnership with Vital Source for their inclusive and equitable access schools, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Um, just looking to see any other questions we're getting from the audience. 
I do see someone has a hand up. We can't call on you live, so you have to use the Q&A function at the bottom. Uh, Jen Hill, that's you. Okay, another question, just how do I get access? So we can go ahead and help. Uh, then questions about, um, oh, no worries, Jen. Um, and then also just questions about our subscription costs. So uh, we have a couple different pricing options. I'll dive into them in a moment, but uh, base price starts at $20 per student per year. And depending on the volume, it can go uh, significantly lower than that with enterprise pricing. Um, and so as we're sort of wrapping up this Q&A, piece here. Uh, the first couple of weeks of our semester, what words of wisdom do you have to share with the audience today, Diana, on things that you'd want them to take away from this? Um, probably that with anything new, with anything new technology, with technology, there's a learning curve and not to get frustrated at the, at the beginning if it doesn't work as smoothly, um, because what works smoothly for me now I had to achieve. Um, I can remember the first couple of weeks, the first couple of weeks of that first semester, um, understanding, you know, where I didn't set the grade book total right, those type of things. Um, I think it's a lot smoother now, especially in our um, university, but just to try it and to see, go and research what people, how people are using it and how successful it is, because I think that you can overcome any of the learning curves um, that come with any new technology. All right, so we will get back to our presentation here. Thank you so much for that, Diana and Nick. And so um, we've answered a lot of these questions. And uh, just to answer folks' questions about pricing and getting set up, uh, if your institution has a hypothesis subscription currently and you are a vital source school, there's nothing more that you need to do than speak to your hypothesis account manager and we'll make sure that that is set up and up and running. For schools that are not using um, vital source with a subscription, we do offer vital source student licensing on Bookshelf by Vital Source. So this gives you the opportunity to implement this directly in your course you don't have to go through your agreements with your procurement department, all those fun things. Uh, you do get your course level reporting, and we do we do support your inclusive and equitable access programs on a course level. So this doesn't have an additional cost to your institution. I think we can all agree with what we just heard from Diana. Getting students to be more engaged, have more thought, and actually complete the reading is a really great benefit to students making a purchase like this because it keeps them locked in. So we will definitely be sure to send that information on out in a follow-up. Uh, and as we wrap up, just thank you all so much for joining, especially at the beginning of a semester in what is a pretty short week that feels longer than ever. Uh, if you want more information about the case studies that we shared or want to get started with social annotation, feel free to reach out to our team at Education at Hypothesis. And for more information about Bookshelf by Vital Source, make sure to check the link uh, here below and you can understand how Bookshelf might transform your courses just like we've seen there at Missouri Southern State. Um, so Diana and Nick, I want to thank you both because you know, it's a crazy week for you as well, but thanks for taking an hour. And I know that the uh, folks on the call are really appreciative. Uh, best of luck with this semester, and I'm sure we'll all be in touch soon. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody.